You're listening to MedEx, the Medical Extrusion Podcast, presented by U.S. Extruders. Extrude with confidence. Custom extrusion equipment designed for you and your application. What's up, folks? Welcome back to the MedEx Podcast. Today's guest is A.J. Petzoldiker, the Technical Director at BioLink. A.J. has a Ph.D. in polymer science from Clemson University. And over the last 20 years, he's been involved with plastics and polyurethanes for medical device applications. AJ was formerly the chief scientific officer at AR Tech Biomaterials and a senior principal scientist at Abbott. AJ is also the author of Plastics in Medical Devices for Cardiovascular Applications, a book that is sold on Amazon. As you can expect, the focus of our discussions will be polyurethanes in medical devices. Enjoy. Thanks for carving out some time to join us on the MedDex podcast today to talk about polyurethanes for medical device applications. Uh, Steve, I'm uh, really delighted to be here. Uh, I think this is uh, uh, not only a a good honor, but uh, I think uh, it's a good opportunity for me to be able to share um, some of the things I've learned and some of the things I've uh, um, experienced over the past uh, so many years. Excellent. Very excited. Uh, I've known you for a long time, AJ, from probably over 20 years when you're yeah. at uh, Aortech, right? We met first yes. in a meeting. Yeah. So, and uh, you invited me to give a talk at a SPE a, a medical conference some time ago. So I appreciate that as well. No problem at all. So I think we have some pretty interesting topics to to discuss related to polyurethane, the material processing and applications. But before we get too deep into some of those topics, why don't we start with a brief background of polyurethane, the chemistry and the structure? Sure, sure. Uh, So if you look at any polymer, one of the most common ways of looking at a polymer and how it is performing, you would differentiate between uh, a thermoplastic polymer and a thermoset polymer. That mm-hmm. is the, one of the most common ways of uh, distinguishing uh, polymers. So thermoplastics are, are uh, obviously something that is uh, meltable, something that's dissolvable, something that uh, can be melt processed, and then thermosets are something that are essentially set, and you can't really do anything with it. So you, you got to either mold it in place, uh, in form, uh, in shape, and so on. Now, interestingly, polyurethanes can be both, can be either thermoplastic or can be thermoset. Now, uh, I can uh, go a little bit uh, more into the details later on what makes it a thermoplastic and what makes it a thermoset. But essentially, in medical applications, uh, what is considered most is the thermoplastic uh, mm. polyurethane. So uh, uh, in short, they are also known as TPUs or thermoplastic polyurethanes. And uh, uh, that is uh, what uh, is considered the most uh, used, or I would say more than 95% of the uh, polyurethanes used in the medical device industry tend to be thermoplastic in nature. Okay. Yeah, I'm interested to hear later about uh, thermoset polyurethanes. That's a first one for me. Let's let's move on to kind of rheology and extrusion of thermoplastic polyurethanes. And we know uh, anybody that sells polyurethanes will tell you that the most important parameter is drying, 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 right? So if you can talk a little bit about that and then also want to go into you know, resonance time, you know, the effect of extrusion resonance time on uh, thermoplastic polyurethane and the the mechanical properties. Right. Uh, I suppose to talk about uh, the rheology and to talk about uh, the effect of uh, drying and so on, I need to take a step or a couple of steps back into the chemistry. Uh, Mm -hmm. So if you look at Thermoplastic polyurethanes, uh, what makes it the thermoplastic as opposed to a thermoset is uh, a functionality of two. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit. So 
Well, urethanes um, are generally the reaction product of uh, isocyanate and a hydroxyl. So isocyanate is an NCO, uh, or in chemical terms, and a hydroxyl is an OH. So a reaction of an NCO and OH gives you uh, the formation of a urethane bond, uh, which is NHCOO. Uh, so uh, a direct combination of NCO and OH. Now, uh, the interesting thing is uh, you can have anything on either side of the NCO and the OH. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes it a mixed polyurethane extremely versatile. I would, I would uh, uh, almost say that it is one of the most versatile polymers there is. So you can have a, a very elastomeric polymer, because, you know, if you have a very elastomeric, uh, um, uh, elastomeric chain attached to the OH or NCO, or you can have a very uh, hard plastic. You can ha actually have something very short attached to an NCO and OH. So you can span the entire um, uh, property spectrum uh, with polyurethanes. Now, uh, one of the things is that this NCO uh, or N, uh, NC, NHCOO the, or the urethane bond is uh, very, uh, is almost like a reversible bond. And so that bond will tend to break up or de, de, uh, uh, disassociate at higher temperatures. Mm -hmm. So now, if you look at the entire mechanism of any melt processing, uh, uh, whether it's uh, extrusion, injection, molding, uh, you are taking the temperature of the material beyond its melting point. And so you're actually um, going beyond the dissociation temperature of the urethane bond. So some amount uh, not everything, obviously, but some amount of the urethanes will dissociate. Now, if you have uh, moisture present in the material, uh, and moisture, if you uh, uh, look at the structure of uh, water, has an OH group uh, or a hydroxyl group, uh, so HOH. And once you break up or dissociate the, the urethane bond, you will have a free NCO. Now, the free NCO is now liable to react with the water that's floating around. And so what will happen is if the water is, uh, is there, the NCO will react with the water. And because it doesn't have any place to uh, extend itself, it will actually terminate the chain. So your chain uh, will actually become shorter and therefore uh, your molecular weight will drop and your properties effectively will drop as well. So that is why it's so critical to dry uh, the polyurethane before melt processing because the water present can actually uh, lead to a reduction in the chain length and drop in molecular weight and consequently a drop in properties. Mm -hmm. So that is the primary reason for making sure that uh, the material is dried uh, properly before use. Okay. That's that's great. Thanks for that. And uh, kind of moving on to the, the residence time in the extruder and how that, you know, can impact mechanical properties as well. Kind of if, walk us through that too from a... <laughs> you know, from a yes. chemistry standpoint. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, so what I said uh, in terms of the versatile nature of polyurethanes uh, also applies to the fact that you uh, have to take great care in uh, the processing. So drying is obviously one. Uh, the other thing, now the versatile nature of polyurethane also is due to the fact that uh, the urethane group or the NCO group in particular within the urethane uh, bond uh, is very reactive. In fact, it is known as a hyperreactive material. So, um, so the residence time 
has a very direct effect. Uh, so one is, of course, the, the presence of moisture that can affect it. Mm -hmm. So drying is important. The second is something known as melt annealing. So it is quite as uh, uh, not a very well-known phenomenon, but it is a very uh, interesting phenomenon. So what happens is uh, if, um, uh, if the polyurethane uh, uh, is sub subjected uh, to high temperature and for a longer time, the melting point of the polyurethane actually increases. Hmm. So, uh, what happens is the um, there is a organization within the microstructure of the polyurethane that actually leads to the formation of hard blocks and soft blocks. Uh, now, hard blocks are more um, NCO or, or urethane rich. And uh, what happens is that as you increase the temperature and the time that is uh, subject to, to that temperature, the, the size of the hard blocks actually increases. And that reduces uh, the ability of that material to melt at that particular temperature. Hmm. So, yeah. so what, what you end up with is a material that is more jelly if you actually have uh, a greater residence time. So uh, if an extruder, um, if you have the material in the extruder for, uh, say, 10 minutes and everything comes out in 10 minutes, that's mm -hmm. fine. But if you have something that sticks in there for an hour or two and then comes out after an hour or two, the possibility of it not being fully molten and therefore more full of gels is is uh, is is higher. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> so great. That's, why the, rest of the, that's yeah. why the rest of the time is so important to to maintain. Okay, that's great. I was I was I was going to go next to gels, and you kind of answered some of that question. Um, I'll still let's talk a little bit about it. A, a friend of mine, Tim Steele, brilliant medical extrusion engineer, and the the founder of Microspec, he uh, he told me one time that the thing to understand about gels is that they're everywhere. <laughs> they're in they're in the raw material from the supplier. They're in the manufacturing process, and then they're in they're in the end device or or tubing, the, the end product. And the, where we're headed with med tech and medical devices and catheters, you might have heard the term "profile is king," meaning we need a thin wall on the catheter or tubing to allow for more fluids, devices, wires on the inner lumens of the catheter so that the, the wall thicknesses of these materials, these catheter tubing are getting thinner. And at the same time, the visual requirements are even more stringent. So thin walls, gels, they come to the surface, could be kind of a nightmare. So um, we talked about, you know, I was going to ask, how do you minimize them? One is the residence time, right? That you just talked about, but is there anything yes. else to, to minimize the, the gels within extruded tubing? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. And uh, that's a very uh, common phenomenon uh, that uh, people notice uh, in extrusion of polyurethanes or even, even in injection molding. So I think we need to understand what, gels are and uh, what gels are how are they fo formed in the first place what can we do to minimize it uh, what can we do co to control its formation so uh, if you look at uh, gels they are traditionally uh, been divided into two different forms of gels one is the uh, known as the p gels or polymer gels and one is known as the E-gels or extrusion gels. So the, uh, the difference between the two is that the P-gels, like you pointed out, Steve, uh, are already existing in the material. Mm -hmm. So P-gels are something that come from the raw material supplier, uh, and they are dependent on uh, what you can do to uh, the, what the process is of making uh, with the polyurethane, making the TKU, and uh, what is resulting in the gels in that 
uh, in that uh, uh, form. Now, the question is uh, how much a um, extruder uh, can actually um, influence what's coming in. So, mm. if the extrusion guy is not really somebody uh, who can influence the the raw material supplier, uh, that's a different question. But the thing is, that there are several steps a raw material uh, uh, manufacturer can take in order to reduce the key gels. So, reducing gels coming in from um, uh, from the raw material supplier, and that includes uh, uh, the things like you know there are pre-polymerization, there are uh, 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 mixing of the chain extender, uh, there is the the actual uh, 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 extrusion that the raw material supplier will carry out before sending the material over, and so on. So there are quite a few steps that uh, the raw material supplier can take to reduce the features. Mm -hmm. Now. Once the material is with the extruder, um, what can you, what can the extruder do to re reduce the e gels? And uh, very clearly, one is what we talked about already is the resistance time. So, what can he do to look at the um, uh, minimizing the holdup in uh, any area? So that that is very clearly a design thing. Well, yeah. uh, and there are computer programs which can actually uh, tell you how to design and how to reduce your, your holdup time. Uh, there is also, um, um, then maybe there is uh, also filtration that you can do. You can mm -hmm. filter out the gels. You can actually, and now there are certain kinds of filters like the uh, uh, sintered uh, fiber metal yeah. filters which work better than uh, the normal uh, 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 wire filters on, uh, on their own. So, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. Candle filters. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But then you, you got to be uh, careful with those as well because, you know, you don't want to overshear your material. So, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, so you have to strike a balance between yeah. uh, what you want and what, uh, is, uh, what do you put in. Okay. Great. When I was a, a young engineer starting out, I worked at a company called Davis Standard, and I was working for a gentleman by the name of Charlie Sparacino, and he was the guy that sold mm -hmm. medical extrusion systems. And I remember, I still remember uh, him getting a call from a customer saying, mm -hmm. hey, Charlie, I need a quote for uh, an extrusion line. It's dedicated to polyurethane. And, and the first thing that came to his mind, polyurethane, going to need a melt pump. And I said, mm. I said, Charlie, why? And he said, well, polyurethane is prone to lot to lot variation. So that's why we mm. want to use a melt pump. Now this is 20 mm. something years ago. Right. And, um, mm. so, but so I think a lot of folks, uh, if you're running dedicated polyurethane, there's a tendency to include a melt pump because of that lot to lot variation. Can you talk to us a little bit about this lot to lot variation or, or, lot to lot molecular weight variation or whatever the chemistry might be that would cause folks to to think that you would need a melt pump for polyurethane yeah yeah absolutely uh so it, that is a, a a good point uh, that you know you do tend to get lot to lot variation and that depends a lot on how the polyurethane is actually made uh so it, it, that depends upon whether it is um, uh, pre-polymerized and then uh, chain extended and uh, made as a batch material or is it made as a continuous reaction extrusion kind of product. Now, both of them have their pros and cons and both of them will lead to a certain level of lot-to-lot uh, -lot variation. Uh, so, um, uh, so th that is almost a uh, a given concept that you will end up with a certain amount of lot to lot variation, and uh, what so therefore uh, using a melt pump is probably a very good idea, and uh, it's also important uh, to actually run the um, uh, the raw material through a rheology test and not just an MFI test, but actually running a rheology test uh, to uh, identify uh, uh, the differences between lot to lot 
and what can you do what can you do in terms of adjustment uh, from a, a temperature share rate perspective on your side so that now another important concept if, if i just may say mm -hmm. um, is is a, uh, the most of the tpus are um, subject to time dependence on the rheology so the rheology is not only dependent on the shear rate, but also on the time. So uh, one of the good measures is actually putting a, uh, 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 measuring the viscosity of, uh, ROM, of, of your TPU uh, at a constant shear rate and over, a, uh, uh, over time, so mm -hmm. over, say, half an hour. So, so you will actually see a reduction in viscosity. Now, there are many different uh, um, phenomena that are uh, uh, attributed to this reduction. One is uh, the whole uh, reversibility of the urethane group. The other is the, the uh, breakup of the allophonate groups. I, I haven't talked about allophonates, mm -hmm. but uh, so there, uh, and that also can vary from lot to lot. And so I think it's important for extruders not only to test the uh, normal rheology, but also to test the time-dependent rheology and then adjust your process uh, as, as uh, de dependent on your results. Okay. Excellent. I know um, polyurethane tubing extrusions can relax over time, right? I know... Um, from experience that the OD and the wall thickness can grow, the length can uh, shorten. Mm -hmm. I think uh, low durometer polyurethanes can uh, shrink uh, at room temperature. And I know uh, during sterilization, you have that phenomenon as well. A good friend of mine, another good friend of mine, a great extrusion uh, engineer, Tyler Ware, co-founder of Gen X Medical, did a study mm -hmm. some years ago to look at the effects of drawdown ratio and mm -hmm. the, the cooling bath temperature, cooling, heating, and the effect on uh, shrinkage of polyurethane tubing. Also, we did a podcast last year with Patrick Daly of Biomerics, and he talked about how they're using a post-process annealing when they're developing compliant polyurethane balloons, and it's really helped them with yields and, and elongation and such. So can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, the shrinkage of a polyurethane tubing and, and some of the ways possibly to avoid it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, with the, again, uh, going back to the fundamentals and the root cause of uh, what is happening in this uh, situation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, when you melt the TPU, uh, when you put it in, into the extruder or the injection molder, uh, you come to a completely amorphous state of the material. Now, this is opposed to a solid uh, TPU, which has got ordered regions, so uh, uh, almost crystalline regions. So all those regions are basically erased as you put it into uh, a molten state. So in, in molten state, it is uh, completely 100% amorphous. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes out, um, uh, it is reformed, uh, when it comes out of the tubing uh, and it goes through the cooling bath, uh, it is obviously uh, drawn down and uh, it, then it comes back to uh, acquiring a certain level of order. So this uh, transition, between a completely amorphous to an ordered state is what causes the shrinkage. Okay. And so you will have a different level of shrinkage, exactly like you said, Steve, uh, with your durometer. So your uh, 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 durometer is, uh, the harder the material is, uh, the greater is the level of organization in the solid state. So, uh, like I said, in a molten state, everything is taken out. Uh, it becomes amorphous. And in a solid state, you'll go to a greater level of uh, order as you uh, increase your hardness. So, your degree of shrinkage 
uh, will be greater uh, as you go uh, harder. Uh, your temperature of shrinkage will be uh, uh, will be dependent on your uh, hardness as well. So, for example, like you said, the low durometer tubing will shrink at room temperature, temperature whereas the hard durometer uh, tubing will not. However, uh, to cancel out uh, both those uh, things, uh, you, uh, annealing is a very good method because uh, you what you're doing is you're um, coming to a st equilibrium steady state, you're taking out all the stresses imposed on the material during its flow, during its drawdown, during its cooling, and so on. So all those things are completely cancelled, and you will have a, a fully uh, equilibrated uh, uh, material on its annealing step. So after your annealing, so so the best way is to actually. Uh, do a, a consistent annealing step, consistent drawdown, consistent temperature of your co cooling bath, at a consistent tem temperature of your um, of your extruder, and then uh, have a relationship between uh, your uh, your temper your um, uh, diameter of your uh, die was uh, versus the diameter of the tubing after annealing. So that is something that will allow you to actually uh, come to a consistent um, uh, shrinkage calculation. Okay, interesting. I know, uh, you know, one of the other challenges with TPUs, especially the low durometers, is the tackiness, right? And I yes, think there's exactly. Different, there's different strategies that folks have taken to reduce the tackiness. I think in the process, like really chilling the water temperature, but then you have mm -hmm. more stresses, right? Mm -hmm. You have to take care of that in annealing. I think there's maybe some additives and compounds related yes. that help reduce the tackiness. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so that is uh, very much a, uh, an issue. Uh, uh, I think if you go lower than 75 or 70 show array in hardness and you start getting tackiness and obviously uh, you, you, it's quite interesting. As you go lower in your durometer, you also tend to uh, improve your gel content. So you're actually coming out with a very nice looking tube. Hmm. Uh, because your gels are dependent on the on your hard block, but anyway, that's a separate topic. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, uh, what people have actually done is, um, uh, 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 like you said, uh, uh, reduce your uh, um, temperature of your chilling bath, uh, 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 and then keep your tubing, cut your tubing, and keep them completely separate so that they don't touch each other. But uh, also, they have actually added in a certain amount of um, uh, waxes and steroids uh, in uh, in the material in order to keep them from actually um, sticking to each other. Uh, now, uh, uh, obviously, it has to go through a certain amount or certain degree of validation and certain degree of whether it's applicable for the application or not. Uh, but uh, you don't need much. You, you just need uh, uh, maybe a couple of percent of the salt, uh, or the, the wax, or the stearate to actually um, uh, uh, prevent the sticking from occurring. But uh, that is a, a viable uh, technique. Okay, excellent. Let's move on to uh, to some medical applications for polyurethane and. and we're going to talk a little bit about biocompatibility, but before we do that, why don't you kind of give us a definition of biostable or biocompatible polymers? Yeah, good point, see, because, you know, there is a, a, a fair degree of um, uh, confusion about, uh, about these definitions. So, first of all, uh, I would like to make it clear that biocompatibility is not a single... Um, single material dependent uh, property. Uh, biocompatibility depends, yes, on the material, but also depends on the function and also depends on the uh, host uh, at uh, in, into uh, where it is implanted. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
Uh, no, there is a definition of biocompatibility that it, uh, the material is biocompatible. All, all, the, all these three things, material, function, and host, result in biocompatibility. We, uh, when the, uh, uh, the implantable uh, material does not uh, cause any harm to your uh, implanted host. Uh, so that is uh, one of the definitions of, of biocompatibility. And um, uh, so the other thing that you have to realize is that the biocompatibility is also dynamic in nature. Uh, it can actually change over time. So we have to consider that as well. And maybe that is one of the places where biostability comes in. Mm -hmm. And uh, the biostability uh, of a material is uh, essentially the ability of the material to withstand uh, everything that the body throws at you. So um, you put a material into the body and the body thinks of it as a foreign object uh, and it'll basically try to attack that foreign object to try and uh, destroy it. Uh, essentially, and that is uh, obviously the way that uh, the bacteria and the virus are dis destroyed in the body. So uh, now the different um, uh, uh, conquants are uh, uh, secreted, excreted by the uh, immune system, which actually allow uh, the destruction of that foreign body. And therefore, uh, the ability of the material to withstand those uh, uh, those pretty uh, um, uh, extensive uh, kind of uh, uh, active objects and active uh, 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 materials, which actually um, might harm the material, harm the uh, implanted material, is is what is biostability. Okay, I know. Um... You have a lot of experience in the past working on biostable bio polyurethanes. And I think with pacing leads, and you did some work with a lot of work with siloxane, right? Can you yeah, share any of that yeah. work just kind of briefly? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'd love to because, you know, uh, uh, siloxane based polyurethanes is something that I've worked for on for more than 20 years. So, uh, so w what happens when a material is uh, implanted in the body? And uh, like I said, the potent um, uh, secretions by the immune system uh, actually go and attack uh, the, the oxidizable uh, parts of the polymer. And these oxidizable parts tend to be present in the soft segment of the polymer in the softer part of the poly all of the hydroxyl containing group of the polymer. So uh, when you look at siloxane based polyols, so siloxane based soft segments, those are very resistant to oxidation. And that is where uh, the siloxane based polyurethanes uh, tend to come in, in the fact that they are extremely biostable and they can last in uh, for a much longer period of time within the body without uh, oxidizing without degrading and now however saying that it is not a very trivial matter to put uh, a siloxane in the polyurethane and the reason being they are completely almost like oil and water mm -hmm. so, so the polyurethane is are very hydrophilic, and the poly and the siloxanes are very hydrophobic. So there are quite a few uh, interesting chemistry steps that we need to take to put them put these two molecules together. AJ earlier talked about thermoplastics, thermosets. Would that siloxane kind of be classified as a thermoset additive? Is that accurate? Uh, so what we're doing when we're making the thermoplastic polyurethanes is that we're using a bifunctional siloxane. Okay. And using uh, or anything which is, which is bifunctional, anything which is has a functionality of two gives you a linear compound, and that is when uh, you end up with the thermoplastic. Now, 
there are possibilities, of course, uh, where you can actually have a, a greater than two functionality and make it a, a, a thermoset. But in this particular case, for uh, medical devices, we use a, bi a bifunctional siloxane, end up with a thermoplastic polyurethane. Okay, excellent. Very, very uh, interesting topics. This is uh, excellent, AJ. I appreciate it. Well, Let's talk a little bit about uh, applications. And, and I want to share at, at some point the, the work you're doing at BioLink a little bit. Um, but just from a, a current application standpoint, if you can just kind of go over briefly some of the applications, the medical device applications, uh, maybe other medical applications uh, that we see uh, heavy use for polyurethanes. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, one of the things, like I said, uh, was uh, the use of uh, siloxanes or uh, use of any um, materials that with, within the uh, TPU that make it very biostable in nature. And if you look at biostable applications, there are uh, numerous uh, applications. Uh, which require uh, the long-term um, integrity of the device. So, uh, assuming that you put in a pacemaker and uh, with a um, insulation that was actually liable to degradation. Now, if you do that, then uh, uh, as the insulation degrades, uh, you will have the uh, electrical signal coming out of the pacemaker not actually reaching where it's intended to reach the heart, which is actually being dissipated somewhere else. So that's why uh, biostable polyurethanes are absolutely essential in life saving applications, pacemakers, defibrillators, uh, 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 other cardiac devices, uh, LVADs or uh, left ventricle assist devices. Uh, even they're coming up now with um, um, uh, heart valves, uh, mm -hmm. which are which have these uh, biostable leaflets uh, that can be used. Now, the same thing that uh, is extended, extended also to uh, neurological applications, uh, neurological stimulation applications. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, um, uh, there also you need uh, um, uh, very biostable, non-degradable polyurethanes that go into the spine or uh, Parkinson's deep brain stimulation devices, you know, all those things. So that is one application or one area of polyurethanes, uh, which is biostability that is uh, very important for applications. Wow. You talked about like structural heart leaflets and Related to that, the stent frames, often we see polyurethane membranes, right? Or, or coatings yeah. over uh, scaffolds. And, yes. And sometimes you see expanded PTFE membranes over scaffolds. And I'm just wondering, is there a benefit of one over the other? Or is it more application specific? If you kind of compare those cover, stent covers, TPU versus E. PTFE stent covers? Yeah, um, I, they, they definitely are application specific. Now, the the whole um, idea is that with e PTFE, you are restricted to only one kind of uh, material, one kind of application, whereas with polyurethanes, you have a, a wider, much, much wider spectrum of uh, you know, properties. So they are application specific, but uh, with polyurethanes, you have the flexibility to even go thinner and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, smaller. Uh, if you can uh, obviously uh, take out all the uh, the, uh, the effects of um, uh, coagulation or anything else that might be, or calcification that might be happening. But yes, you have a much greater flexibility with polyurethanes. Okay. Let's let's uh, talk a little bit about some of the work you're doing at BioLink, and I, I happened to go on your website and I saw this very interesting slide here. Um, if, if you don't mind, you tell us a little bit about the company and what you're doing. And this uh, this uh, you know, when, whenever I see twenty times more shallow, or, or that that's uh, seems to me less less trauma maybe on a patient. I don't know, but maybe you can go through that. Yeah, yeah. Um... 
So one of the things that uh, uh, any continuous glucose monitoring um, uh, application is that you need a, a membrane uh, or, or outside your needle and to allow for certain permeation properties. As, so you want the glucose to go in, for example, but you don't want the amount of glucose to go in that will actually saturate your enzyme. So uh, it's uh, uh, the uh, entire uh, glucose monitoring is based on the enzyme that is deposited on the needle. Uh, so uh, that enzyme is what detects the glucose. Uh, so polyurethanes can afford you uh, that level of uh, permeation this, or selective permeation that so you can, you can allow a certain uh, analyze to, to permeate through the uh, membrane and that that will actually uh, act uh, on the enzyme and so you can de detect the glucose so that is the entire um, uh, function of uh, the membrane of polyurethane that is outside uh, uh, the, the needle. Now, with um, the BioLink, uh, the main thing is that uh, uh, it is a, the, the principle of glucose monitoring is the same. However, it is done on a micro needle uh, as opposed to a, uh, a needle uh, which is uh, longer. Uh, and that means that you have you end up with a much uh, shorter uh, needle uh, uh, penetrating into the body so you're actually effectively doing a subdermal analysis of your glucose levels uh, as opposed to a subcutaneous uh, with a longer needle gotcha. and uh, and therefore you your insertion of the needle into the skin is barely noticeable. You can, uh, the patient uh, doesn't even feel the needle going into the skin. So that is uh, clearly one uh, big difference uh, of biolink. Okay, interesting. Let's let's kind of wrap things up and talk about some kind of next generation applications and, and you, we're going to talk a little bit about drug delivery polyurethane for drug delivery in biodegradables yes um, so uh, one of the things i mentioned was the fact that uh, polyurethanes are extremely versatile in nature uh, you can go from soft jelly material to a hard plastic and everything can be a can be a polyurethane. Um, one of the promising uh, applications for polyurethane using this nature is uh, a drug delivery. So polyurethanes can be very effective excipients uh, or drug carriers. Now, why would uh, polyurethane be different from other materials? It's because you have uh, the ability in polyurethanes to actually uh, put in uh, very different uh, soft blocks and hard blocks uh, or very different components which can actually interact in a, in a different manner with the, with the drug. So depending on what uh, your uh, ingredient or component is in, in, in the polyurethanes, you can regulate the release of the drug uh, to, to much faster or a much slower uh, release rate of kinetics. So your kinetics of release can be very effectively modulated uh, across different kinds of polyurethanes. And of course, uh, with them being of different um, uh, durometers, you can actually um, uh, play with that as well in order for, uh, depending on your application, depending on your delivery method and so on. So yes, drug delivery is definitely a, a, a very um, uh, upcoming uh, method for polyurethanes and for polyurethane applications. Interesting. When I, when I think of... Uh drug delivery and 
biodegradables. I always think of a polylactyl, PLLA type materials that are right, used for those right. reasons. Right. So uh, coming to biodegradables, um, I mean, your drug dairy, uh, like you said, uh, can be dependent on biodegradation. However, it can be, uh, you can actually make it diffusion de dependent. So dependent on your diffusion uh, using uh, more biostable material. Mm -hmm. So that is definitely a possibility. However, there are uh, there's a uh, entire class of biodegradable materials. Now that is another uh, interesting thing with polyurethane because you have this uh, versatility. You can put in uh, components which tend to degrade in the mm -hmm. body. Uh, so uh, the opposite end of the biostable, you can actually do it as well with polyurethane. You can make it biodegradable, and in those situations, you can actually uh, allow the healing of the body and degradation occurring at the same time. So, for example, you can have an orthopedic implant, uh, which can actually allow the uh, the cartilage or the uh, uh, the ligament to grow as your uh, uh, support for with uh, the orthopedic device is actually degrading away. So you can have a, after uh, uh, a few months or a few years, you can have as almost zero uh, uh, of the device remaining in the body and your body completely healed. So that is definitely one area that is uh, that needs uh, a greater attention. And, and I, I think it is something that is occurring as well. Excellent. It totally disappears in the body. Yes, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Excellent. AJ, like I said, this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us. We had some great conversations and great topics, and I'm sure the listeners will enjoy it as well. No, uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, having me on the podcast and uh, asking some excellent questions because uh, as I know you uh, over the years, uh, you have such a great uh, experience and knowledge in uh, different areas of uh, uh, material processing, extrusion, uh, material handling and so on. So yeah, it's always been fun to talk to you. That means a lot coming from you, AJ. Thank you. Thank you for listening to MedEx, the medical extrusion podcast presented by U.S. Extruders. Please subscribe to make sure you're getting the latest episodes. For video episodes, go to us-extruders.com forward slash podcasts. All links are available in the show notes.